Good evening and welcome to tonight's discussion between David Harewood and Gary Young on why literature matters. I'm Kamila Shamsi, a vice, you forgot my vices, a vice president of the Royal Society of Literature and it's my very great pleasure to, in, to welcome you all to the first in-person gathering of the RSL since March 2020. We are very pleased. To, yeah, let's all just have a little <laughs> moment. We're very pleased to be here with you all in the room and online because there are people joining us online as well for this special evening of conversation. Tonight we have the latest edition in the series of discussions celebrating the RSL's five-year bicentenary festival, RSL 200, bringing together writers and thinkers to reflect on the importance literature has on our lives. Other speakers over the last year have included Claudia Rankin, Brian Eno, Stephen Fry, Ali Smith, Philippe Sands, Marlon James, Marina Warner, and Neil Gaiman. You can watch many of these back online through the RSL's website. In this evening's joint event between the RSL and the British Library, our speakers will explore the duality of growing up both black and British, David Harewood's personal recovery from crisis, and their most treasured texts. It's a privilege now to be introducing Gary Young, an award-winning author, broadcaster, and academic, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Formerly a columnist at The Guardian, he has now been appointed Professor of Sociology at Manchester University. He's also the Alfred Nobler Fellow for Type Media in America. His books include Another Day in the Death of America, The Speech, the story behind Martin Luther King's dream, and Who Are We? and should it matter in the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming both Gary and David. And I am delighted to um, be here, to be in conversation with David Harewood. Uh, David was born in Birmingham. Uh, his parents, like mine, uh, from Barbados and moved to England in the 50s and 60s. He's best known uh, as the actor with roles in Homeland and um, Supergirl. Uh, but tonight, a lot of what we're going to talk about stems from his critically acclaimed documentary about his descent into psychosis, Psychosis and Me, and uh, this excellent book, Maybe I Don't Belong Here, which explores issues of mental health, race, and the challenge of being black in a uh, white, overwhelmingly white British society. Uh, David, when, um, uh, uh, when it was announced that we would be doing this, David went on Twitter, and first of all, his first tweet was, it's on. This is going to be a, a great event between me and Gary. I'm going to stay off the pies for this one. <laughs> to which I tweeted back and said, well, can I have your pies? <laughs> um, and then two days ago, he tweeted, Monday night at the British Library, still a chance to come see me chatting to the brilliant Gary Young. He's buying drinks after, <laughs> which I'm not. <laughs> um, uh, um, there will be, uh, there are books uh, to buy afterwards. There will be a chance uh, for you to ask questions, and we will also be taking questions from uh, those of you who are watching around the country and maybe the world online. Uh, but for now, I'd like to introduce uh, the man I'll be in conversation with for the next hour, David Harewood. He is buying drinks afterwards, by the way. <laughs> And he didn't stay off the thighs. <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't know that. I, I saw you demolish a five guys back in the green room. <laughs> um, I want to start, David, with um, the beginning of your book, which describes an upbringing very much like mine. You come home from school, you dump your bag, um, your parents may be in, they may not be in. Mm -hmm. But the telly, go straight, you go straight to the telly, you go through the telly until kind of, um, you know, the end, the last Captain Pugwash or whatever it is, the cartoon, then it's the news, 
and you kind of tune out. And then you tune back in for Citizen Smith, Terry and June, Robin's Nest, all, all the stuff. kind of greats of the uh, 70s uh, and 80s. And uh, this is an event about literature matters. Neither of us were avid, particularly avid readers um, as children. What did you get from the telly? What did it give you? I think I got performance. I loved um, watching, um, my favorite was Tommy Cooper and, uh, and Frankie Howard and Leonard Rossiter. People who could just, just hold an, uh, an audience in, you know, just hold them spellbound and with a sort of twist of the head or a kind of raise of the eyebrow, just have people in fits of laughter. I loved that. So I sort of, that's what I sort of kind of latched onto. As you say, I did, there weren't many uh, books in the house, but, but it, was, it was the idea of performance and, and particularly laughter. I, I'm, I, I, you know, I, 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 I loved the sound of laughter. My parents had these fantastic um, um, laughs. The pair of them had these fantastic laughs. And uh, just, just something about hearing people, particularly my mum, you know, having this, this raucous laugh, which just used to fill me with joy. And uh, I, I think as a, as, as, as a kid, you know, I was aware outside the house there was danger, um, you know, particularly racism. But inside that house, when there was the sound of laughter, I just felt like the safest kid in the world. And just sitting at my, those are my, my best memories of kind of sitting, watching TV, laughing, hearing my mum and dad laugh. Like, that's kind of what got me into performance. I mean, I don't know about you, but I remember there was a girl in, uh, it would have been my third year, which would now be year five, who was reading Wuthering Heights. And I remember just thinking, why, why would you do that? <laughs> not, not, not understand it, because mm. books seemed like a thing you might do, mm. but that didn't have that, didn't prompt that sort of joyous kind of um, uh, response or, or, or a collective response. Mm. You know, you, if, you, if in that scenario that you painted, if your family had been readers, you'd all have been sat Somebody around in books. your... Um, uh, and so it wasn't until I was much older that I discovered the joy of reading. I mean, I'm like your, I had books in the house, but I didn't read them. Right. Because um, I, I loved the telly. The telly was the telly was the main focal point. Like, I, you know, um, I, I'm the same as you. I, I even at school, I, I think my, I think I was pretty pretty bad academically. Um, I just didn't get. I didn't get. I, I went to school to play football. <laughs> I, I went to school to play with my mates, to laugh with my friends, to kind of. I enjoyed the camaraderie, the sort of company at school, but I didn't get it. And even even I think even as a as a young kid, um, I can remember some of my friends, some of my white friends you know, sort of, you know, going off to different classes and thinking, well, why are they going down the corridor? And then sort of understanding that they were sort of in the smarter group. And I was sort of in the naughty group because <laughs> I was always laughing and messing around. And, and I, 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 guess, I guess I was sort of deemed um, disruptive. So, 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 so I was sort of... When you say you were deemed disruptive, you mean you were disruptive? I was... <laughs> <laughs> I just used to make people laugh. I wanted to make people laugh. Again, again, that was where this performance thing came in. I just, and I, you know, I write that in the book, you know, as soon as I knew I could sort of hold an audience, as soon as I knew I could sort of make gags and, and, and make people laugh, that was my sort of go-to thing. It was never, it was never sort of, I, I want to be the brightest kid in this class. I, I, for me, it was like, I want to make as many people in this classroom laugh as I can, you know. I'm going to come back to that, but I, I want to um, just talk about some of the books, because there were, well, they were plays, really, weren't they? It seems, from the autobiography, there were moments with the uh, King Lear, mm. Othello, mm. that kind of, um, where pennies dropped, where you thought, and, um, uh, the, and the f it's a film, but it feels more like a play, the jury... Uh, what's it called? Um, Twelve Good Men? Uh, Twelve Angry Men. Twelve Angry yeah. Men. Yeah. Um, uh, that was the moment where you thought, God, I would love a piece of that. Um, I'm wondering at what point a penny dropped that there was, you were very good at football, but 
you kind of figured out that wasn't going to pan out? I knew I, I, knew I wasn't going to, yeah, that I, I wasn't really cut out for, 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 for the game. But for me, it was, you know, you know, so I was in a bit of a naughty group of guys. And I think uh, my, my class, my head teacher, my classroom teacher, um, told us one day we, he was going, we were, we were going to see King Lear. And we just thought it was a night out. So, so we just thought, so, you know, I'm going to put our hands up. And for some reason, four of the naughtiest kids in the class <laughs> got to go to this King Lear. And I, we honestly, we, we fully intended to laugh and mess around and drink and just, and just mess around. And literally at the end of the play, we were all in tears. Four of these big, burly lads. And we were all <laughs> just fighting <laughs> at, at, this, at this Shakespeare play. And it, I remember just thinking, it just, it just blew my mind that anybody could write like that. Or anybody, you know, somebody could perform that. And I think that was, for me, that was the moment. That, you know, I mean, there were always a lot of pennies that dropped, but that was the one moment where I thought, I had no idea drama, acting, a, a play, could create such sort of magic. So all the things that you um, have referred to, um, uh, Roster, Tommy Cooper, um, they're all uh, 12 Angry Men. Mm. There are no black people in any of them. I would be amazed if there were any black people in the King Lear production that you saw. No, the there weren't, not then. No. Um, and uh, I have it on reliable authority that Shakespeare was a white guy. <laughs> so they say. Uh, <coughs> and, and you found, you found inspiration in them. And later it feels like that was also the beginning of a house of cards, if you if you like. That you, the, the, but let's start with the inspiration, because people can get very binary about this stuff, I think, quite often. Mm -hmm. um, um, that black kids need black books, mm -hmm. as opposed to black kids need books that are good and relevant, and they may be written by black people or they may not. Um, uh, and I think people can get quite, kind of quite utilitarian about it. But you were in, inspired by different kinds of canons mm. that were all very white. Yeah, and you know, I think perhaps that's probably, I always wonder whether that was the sort of naivety that, that, that I had, but I, I didn't see any difference between me and the performers. Um, it, was, it wasn't until I left drama school. When I went to drama school, again, it was, you were in a very creative, world you're playing hamlet you're playing romeo you're playing all these different characters and right from even from the national youth theater when i went to the national youth theater it was just the ability to play that i loved i could sort of be anybody do anything go anywhere and it wasn't until i came out of drama school that the sort of world said to me you're black and you can't do this and you can't do that and suddenly i was realizing that I was going for parts that were black parts and not, not, you know, not, not lead roles or not. And I suddenly started realizing there was, a, sort of, there was a difference. And I think that was sort of the moment for me that I in my head that I started to understand the significance of my color. And I, I, up until that moment, I hadn't seen it. I just thought I could play anybody and, play and, and do anything. And I think that was sort of, yeah, that was probably the beginning of my what I would saw my what I would say is my un, my unraveling really. But you do chronicle a range of racist experiences that you had as a child. The guy who walks up to you takes the effort to walk all the way up to you and tell you to fuck off back to where you came from or something yeah, like I that. Yeah, I was seven. Yeah, yeah, and <coughs> there are a few situations that you're in. How did you understand them? I buried them. Right. And I think, I think that's a part of the experience of, I think that is part of the experience of maybe uh, British black people, how we internalize a lot of those uncomfortable feelings. And I think I did. I, I, in, you know, whenever I experienced racism, I just always remember being very tense as a kid and, and not knowing how to talk about it, not knowing, not knowing how to deal with it. And I think with my dad, I always used to ask my dad about how I deal with it. And he would never speak about it. Mm. 
And um, I'm not surprised because, you know, you know there, there are times when I don't want to speak about it because it's uncomfortable. Mm. And I think I just buried all those, all those experiences. I just sort of just, just put them away or compartmentalized them and shoved them away and, um, and just tried to brush over them. But I, but I think, you know, when I did my documentary, uh, when I found out why I had my breakdown, I was just really surprised by how many times in my medical notes, because I was given my medical records from 30 years ago in this documentary. And um, there was a scene in the documentary where I'm supposed to open my medical records and read what I see. And the first thing I saw I just made me just shut the envelope and I said, stop filming. I don't want to film anymore. And I buried, I, I, I put that envelope on a shelf and I didn't open it for two years. And um, when I started writing my book, I knew I had to open that envelope. Mm. And the thing that I saw that frightened me, and this was from 30 years ago, and again, this, just, this shows just, just how much I buried it. The first, thing, the first thing I saw was I'd said to the doctor, well, the doctor had said, the patient believes he's merged hearts with a young black boy. And I just thought, what, what is that? What, 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 do I, what do I mean by that? I think I just got so lost in this institution. I was so deluded. And for me, I, it was almost like I had to get back to that young kid that sat in front of the TV mm. and wanted to, was impressed by Tommy Cooper. And I wanted to get back to that kid because I, I'd lost myself in a world of uh, going to drama school and play acting. And I'd buried all this racial stuff. In, in the years, in the interim years of being a, a, young, a young man, I buried all that stuff. I just had to get back to the person that I knew, which was that young, young black boy. I mean, that, one assumes that's a coping mechanism, right? Oh, completely. I mean, in my, in my family, we talked about racism a lot, but there was, I had an interesting moment in 2010. I was back from the States to cover the election and uh, I met up with some friends from school. Well, I grew up in Stevenage. Pretty much everyone I knew was white outside my family. And um, pretty much everybody that I knew was white. And I'm having a drink. We're catching up with friends I haven't seen them for a long time. And they've read my first book, uh, No Place Like Home. And the first chapter of that book is about growing up black in Stevenage. And I don't write about a litany of bigotry or but I do write about some of the stuff that happened to my family and and they were all it felt like they were almost disappointed and that they, they said you know why did we not know any of that stuff mm. why didn't you talk to us about that and and the disappointment or the kind of hurt came from them thinking but I know you and now I think I don't know you and and the truth was that there was a way in which they kind of didn't because there was a bunch of stuff that I'd been, it'd been inculcated, never explicitly, but like, you just gotta get through it, mm. you know? And to the extent it was talked about explicitly, it was like, look, um, there's no point in coming home and complaining about the racism in this country, because this is what, so you, we have to, you have to just, just go out and it. deal with it. Yeah that you come back and complain about a teacher, I'm going to tell you to go out and kind of find a way. And, um, and that is a kind of quite a heavy load. And what's scary, I think, and what comes out in your book and in the documentary, is you don't even realise you're carrying it until something, something happens, mm. that some, something either breaks or opens, uh, in your case, it felt like a break or unraveled in, um, in your case. C c certainly an unraveling, but I think you're absolutely right that just on a daily basis, just how normal these things are, how normal that exper those experiences are, um, that, uh, that you just have to, as you say, you just have to kind of, you just have to accept, or not even accept, but, you know, I remember going to school with the NF, you know, signs written everywhere mm. and, you know, you would literally get off a bus and find yourself chased down the street by a gang of skinheads. And 
you didn't know why they were chasing you. Well, you knew why, because you were black. Yeah. But um, just running through gardens and having old ladies direct, the, direct your pursuers to where you were. And, and uh, that was just part of the experience of just, you know, you'd sort of hide, you'd get away, you'd get home, and then you'd eat your dinner <laughs> and, and sort of watch Tommy Cooper. <laughs> and then you'd get up the next day and it, and it might not happen the next day, but then it would happen the next day after. Mm. Or just randomly walking home in the street on the way home from school, random Wednesday afternoon, sun shining, suddenly, nigger! Out of a car. And you tense up and... and I, I, that was just, a, just part of the course. Just an experience that you just sort of... was just normalised and, and, and normal. And I think... I think... I, I, you know, I just think the sort of... the coping mechanisms that we have for that is just to sort of bury it and just almost pretend it's not happening or, or just try and get over it. But as you say, you know, with me in particular, I think there was eventually at that age of 23, I just, it just broke. And as I say, literally most of my, most of my medical records are just littered with some very uncomfortable um, things that I said that, you know, racially are very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable to re for me to read now. Some of the, some of the, how dislocated my mind was. To what extent do you think that the access to, availability of stories, and here I don't mean kind of Goldilocks and the Three Bears kind of stories, but I mean narratives of who you might be would have helped in that situation. That kind of the, Because there are so many narrow avenues that we might go down, you're, you're, you're getting into acting, and if you were to say, look, I want to play um, a drug dealer, a pimp, or they'll be like, you know, we have so many parts for you. And if you mm. say, um, uh, I'd, I'd like to play King Henry VIII, they're like, yeah, we'll, we will call you. Mm. Never. Mm. We will never call you. Um, and that what I've seen with, or what I've noticed with white friends and with rich friends um, was a kind of range of things that they thought they might do. Like the, the presence of me and you on this stage, given our, where we started, mm. is implausible. If my mother was alive, she'd be like, <laughs> doing up there. Yeah. And, and yet here we are. And so you, we are kind of... Almost anomalies in that sense. Well, we're like those cartoon characters that run off the edge of the cliff and so long as you don't look down you can keep running <laughs> but as soon as you look down you're sunk right and and I, i'm just i'm just wondering the degree to which the route maps for you at that age well what am i going to do you've done a couple of plays you've seen how stereotyped and typecast you would be it was enormously frustrating because you are only limited by you're limited by the perceptions of others. I knew I had talent. I've always known I've had talent, uh, that, that I'm a talented actor. A drama school people told me, and I knew I, I, I had talent. Yet when I came out, I, that was the frustrating thing, is I couldn't, I couldn't get beyond mm. people's perceptions. And that was enormously frustrating for me. And I think that's why so many black actors end up going to America, British black actors, go, because, because their, your horizons are so much higher. And you, you're almost allowed, as you have a much more, a wider palette to, to draw from. And I don't know whether that's because in American society you have, you know, uh, black people right through uh, uh, the strata of American society. So it's plausible to have a, a, a black sheriff or a black mm. chief of police. Over here they go, well, there isn't really a black chief of policeman, so you can't really play that. Mm. And that sort of limited idea that is, is so frustrating not just for me, but for a lot of black actors, because you, you can only play what they can believe. Mm. And, and that's, that's when you start sort of, unra that's, that's when you start unraveling. That's when you start getting very frustrated. So that, but you're absolutely right that, you know, those, you, you know, I mean, those stories, as you were saying, I mean, as James Baldwin used to say, you know, you know, he grew up watching the Cowboys and Indians and he all thought he was the Cowboys. He thought he was the, he thought he was the hero. Mm. And then reality, you find out, actually, no, you're the Indians. 
and and that's at that point you suddenly start realizing, oh, you know, the world is very is very different, and I'm I can only I can only play certain roles and not the sort of the the, the, the bright shiny ones, the hero roles, mm. and that's when you start getting frustrated. I just want to ask you one question about class because when it comes to uh, you know the the title of your book maybe I don't belong here I I feel that it could be that I have simply priced in race from an from the get-go I you know all of my school pictures you know nobody says which one are you right you know. um, the nativity play both me and both my brother we all were kings in the nativity play <laughs> because the kings came from afar. <laughs> so, like... You can play we, that. Yeah, you can get away with that. We got you, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so it was kind of priced in and it was... Um, but some of the keenest um, feelings I've had of not belonging have been about class. And you were a black, black kid at RADA. You're also a working class kid at RADA. And when I think of... For example, reading, I didn't read for pleasure until I was surrounded by a bunch of posher kids who had read. Mm. And I started reading out of spite, not love. I was like, you fuckers aren't any cleverer than me. <laughs> but you've read a lot more books than me, and that's something I can do something about. And then, you know, then I found out I liked it. Who mm. knew? Mm. And, um, and that was the beginning of me reading. And I'm just wondering, you, in your book, you explore the white space. Mm. Um, and I don't think that they are opposed at all, the white space and the class space. I think they're intimately uh, entwined. But I'm just wondering how you experience that class. I, I, I didn't really have that same feeling as you. I, I kind of got to Rada, and for me, it was suddenly I'm studying Moliere and Chekhov and Dostoevsky, and I'm like, wow, this stuff's incredible. I never paid any attention at school. I thought it was all, I just didn't really get it at school. Maybe I just wasn't ready for it. But at, at, Rada, at, at Rada, I was like, I love this stuff. It, it really set me alight. So I didn't really have that sense of that I was, you know, surrounded by sort of more intelligent kids or posher kids. I just sort of, I just sort of, it's like a blanket that I sort of, I wrapped myself in. I just loved it. So I, I sort of ran towards it and, 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 and just sort of soaked it in. But I've never, for me, that, it, that maybe I don't belong here. It has always been essentially a racial, a racial question for me because, mm. because you know, particularly when people are telling you to fuck off back to where you came from or, mm. or, 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 or go home, there was always that sense of me, well, you know, I, I know I'm not necessarily, I, I've, I've never always felt particularly comfortable here, or, or comfortable, but welcome. Mm. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a part of me which feels as though, I don't know, that, that, that I'm sort of, I'm from somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've always felt my presence here is qualified, you know, that I would have to, it's contingent and qualified, right. and that somehow, um, I have to explain it to both myself and others. And that kind of weird, a guy at university saying to me uh, on the university court, Mr. Young, where are you from? And I said, Stevenage. He said, well, where were you born? I said, Hitchin. Right. And he said, before then. I said, well, there was no before then. Mm. He said, where are your parents from? I said, Barbados. Oh, Barbados, yes. You're from Barbados. <laughs> I said, no, I'm from Hitchin. And he said, um, I was in Ghana. I'm thinking, that is a long way from Barbados. Mm. <laughs> and it's a long way from Stevenage, and I don't know what you want from me right mm. now. And, um, um, and that, that notion of always having to qualify, yeah. which actually I found, after a while, I just stopped bothering with geography for community, that kind of, I, I call myself Black British, because those are the two kind of things that make sense as a kind of shorthand. 
But the, when people ask me, where do I feel most at home? I say, I feel most at home where my people are. You know, people who like a drink and a laugh and aren't too pompous mm -hmm. and um, um, preferably with some kids about. And that could be anywhere. But the, the geography, there's no place. Because I did the thing, I don't know if you did this. I went to Barbados when I was 18. Not exactly expecting kind of, you know, people to be waving flags and welcoming me, but thinking, imagining that this was my home. home. Right. And then you really quickly find in, out. In that, Barbados, they call you an Englishman. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Just been dealing with that. But exactly. So, so then you come here and, you're, and, and they ask you where you're from. Mm. Or to go home. So for me, there's this constant state of dislocation, which I think... I, I think it plays right into the high rates of psychosis and mental illness of a lot of uh, people of colour. Yeah, so I was going to say, that sense of dislocation, of not belonging, and also the sense of a kind of both specific, because it's coming to you b because you're black, but random, because it could go to any black person, sense of unfairness. Mm-hmm that kind of um, uh, compounds your fragility in that moment in the book. And you, you crawl out of that. You kind of, you really fight your way out of it. There's a, there's a wonderful section in the book where David describes, um, he thought, right, to get out of here, I'm gonna have to do everything right. Normal. Normal. Mm. And so normal is he wants to change the date on the calendar because it's got the wrong day. And this is a kind of long process for, for him, which he describes, and he, he gets it done. And it's such a sense of achievement that he describes it. He says, it's like I did the Rubik's Cube with my arm, <laughs> which, I, which to, was you, an image what, that what, I struggled what, what to get you, out of my what, head. What you, what you have to understand is that as a, as a, as a black person in, in, in a mental institution, and apparently this is standard, that you are generally over-medicated. And I was given, I didn't know this, again, this has all come from my medical records. I was given four times the legal dosage, doses of sedatives. Four times. So I was completely out of it. And I knew that I, I, you know, I'd have these moments of lucidity where I'd come round in this, and I'd say, I'd just think, there were no black people on the ward, no black staff, and I just knew I had to get out. So um, I just, my, my, my brother had said to my brother, older brother said to me, if you want to, if you want to get out of here, you've got to start acting normal. And I thought, I'm an actor. <laughs> I've got to act normal. <laughs> so I just literally acted my way out of the place. I just kept it down. I didn't answer back. I didn't, I, because normally, you know, the first week I was in there, you know, people are trying to give you tablets. You don't know what's in the tablet. What's, what's in this tablet? I'm not taking that tablet. Next thing you know, there's two big nurses coming around, ready to just hold you down. So I just said to myself, I'm not going to answer back. I'm going to take whatever the fuck they give me. I'm not going to act up, I'm not going to play up, I'm not going to get in your face, question you, I'm just going to play the game. And that was how I got out of that place. And I humorise it, and, I, and, mm. it, and it was, you know, it was a, it was, that was my escape plan, my Shawshank <laughs> escape plan to get off, get off this mental ward, but it worked. After five days, I was released into the care of my mother. But I know for a fact that that still happens to this day. And since writing this book, and since talking about this, I've been contacted by people who run facilities in, around London that are 80% full of black men. 80% of their hospital wards are full of black men. And all of them are over-medicated. And not all of them are gonna get off that ward. So even in that moment where you're kind of reaching bottom, where you're in this facility, where you, there is racial isolation even then. Completely. And do you, 
at what point, given that part of the um, part of the descent into psychosis, if that's a fair way to put it, was the unraveling was realizing was a, a racial um, schism and undoing. Yeah, 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 I mean, I do, had no idea. I, 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 but I mean, again, once the once I suddenly once I just to, to, to dive in there, once I understood the reality, and it seems it seems bizarre, but the reality of the consequence of my colour mm. on my career. You know, I'm not I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I smoked a lot of weed. I drank. I was very unhappy because I suddenly realised that my dreams of playing the hero, my dreams of playing Bond. You know, all the kids have these. We all come out of drama school thinking you're going to be the the guy. They were all dashed. I suddenly realised that none of that was going to happen because I was going to play. I'm only playing what people can see me as, and that reality was crushing. So I remember, I remember walking around. This is when the delusions and hallucinations started for me. And I, I remember walking around town, trying to find an image of myself in any movie poster in the West End or theatre poster. And I couldn't find a single black face on any movie poster or any theatre poster. And I thought, what am I doing? What am I doing? What have I done? Wasted my life. And it was this panic started to just overwhelm me because I realised I'd, I'd almost like bam, been bamboozled. I sort of believed I was going to be this famous... It's, it's come to pass, but I believed I was going to be this, you know, I could play anything. Mm. And suddenly, I, you know, what I was looking at was, it, it, just, it just wasn't happening. I, could, I couldn't see myself reflected anywhere. And is your racial consciousness growing while you're in the facility? Are you kind of... Because it, it sounds like there's a realisation, I'm the only black person in here, they are kind of... I'm not going to be treated... I'm going to have to... The understanding you're going to have to act yourself out of that mm. is partly born from a racial understanding from what you're saying. You, mm. you, you could see that there were only white people and so on. Which seems like a really hard place to be processing that fact. Which is why, you know, my, um, I have a, a friend of mine who's a clinical psychologist and she said that's one of the reasons why um, particularly black males tend to, only tend to enter the mental health system at a point of crisis. So you don't want to, you don't go, to, you don't go for help. You go when you're sectioned. And it's because you don't, you fear being in a place where you're, you're going to be othered. And if you, I mean, my dad was sectioned. And I only learnt this the other day. I only learnt this the other day. It was, you know, I was speaking to my mother and she said that um, he always feared that they were going to take him back. And he did not want to go back into, the, into that place. And it was only my skill, as, as I said, as an actor, that got me out. It was only because I knew I was playing a game. I was playing... A, a, a gentleman Jim. I was playing a nice, well-behaved black person, talking to, trying to talk to the nurses, you know, being very communicative, as much as I can, duh, duh, with these being drugged up. But I was doing my best to behave myself, because the minute I started to get lively, here's another tablet. The minute you get agitated, there's a couple of nurses, you know. So, I, so that's, that was only my, my, because I had assimilated, because I was used to being in the white space, because I was used to being in that environment. It was only because I was used to that that I just knew how to get myself out of it, which was just play the nice, gentle, well-behaved black person. I just want to talk about masculinity for a little bit. Your, your, your dad, uh, having been sectioned, um, your own experiences and the notion first of all 
regardless of race, that men don't cry, that men don't talk about their feelings, that mm -hmm. men don't talk to each other honestly about kind of, you know, how things are going. And the pressure, I would say, under late stage capitalism for men to provide and perform when those jobs don't actually exist and, um, and the structure isn't there. And then m maybe, and I'd be interested to know your views on this, a kind of black masculinity which actually ups that quite yeah. a lot. That like, um, um, you know, real men. And, um, and um, I mean, look at, you talk about walking through the city and not being able to see a vision of yourself but the visions that one would see of, uh, of black men, you don't see tenderness, mm. you don't see em emotional intelligence, you know, you, you see brutishness and, and, uh, and so on. And I'm, I'm just wondering how, where masculinity fits into this, and particularly black masculinity. I can be honest with you, I, 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 there, was a, there was a part of me that actually thought that by writing this book, I was gonna sort of fall, fall foul of, of Letting the side down, you know, people say, oh, you're being weak, you know, um, crying, you're you know, being emotional, you're being vulnerable. And actually, it's been anything but that. And the amount of people, particularly young black men who've come up to me and said, thank you. Thank you for doing that. You know, particularly someone like you, successful, big black guy, crying on telly. It's, 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 I've not seen that before. Mm. And I, and, and, and ra rather than it sort of um, negatively impacting, I mean, I, the, the day after the documentary went out, which was, I was in a really vulnerable place. I bet. Really, and I didn't, I didn't, I, it's, it's this odd thing, but this whole thing has sort of been a little bit um, of a journey for me. Um, and I actually thought the documentary was gonna be a laugh because, um, Part of psychosis, an early early psychosis, is kind of it's preceded by mania, high high dopamine levels in your brain. You're actually quite up, and I did lots of crazy things, lots of funny things, lots of again. My whole impetus was about entertaining and making people laugh. So I was walking on the tr on, going on the train, singing to people, and you know, hiding weed outside Buckingham Palace. Hiding weed outside Buckingham Palace. <laughs> Just doing crazy things, but but people were responding, mm. and I was like, "This is great." I'm, and I actually thought, if I could control this, this is going to be great. Now I'm having conversations with strangers and laughing with them. But what I had forgotten was the crash on the other side of that, which was really painful, and the, the documentary really shocked me. You, you could see that that you, you the thing you talk about will. Be about burying, yeah, that kind of there was a consequence for that in the in the psychosis, but then what came out of the documentary and is kind of really illustrated in the book is that you kind of then kind of buried the psychosis. I buried the know, psychosis. Uh, in, I buried and made it a kind of a story you could tell. It was a joke. Mm. I buried the pain of it, the trauma of it. And the documentary reintroduced me to that in a big way. And I was terrified. And actually, when I started running adverts for it, I had a real panic. Because I thought, what have I done? Oh, man, I remember seeing the first advert for it, and I was really scared. And uh, I didn't watch it when it came out. I bet. I went to bed. The entire house went to bed. I think, I think my anxiety must have spread through the house. Because my kids, my kids just went, just like disappeared, and my wife was like gone. And she went to bed, and I was just sitting there in the dark, and I thought, "God, what's happening? Everyone's watching this me unravel." And um, I went to bed, and then I, I and then I, I fully expected. Well, I don't know what I expected, but I, I just remember. I remember just about to draw, drop off to sleep, and my phone started beeping, and my emails pinging. Everything was buzzing and beeping and tweaking. Bing dong, bing bing. <laughs> And I grabbed the first thing and turned it off, and then the second thing and turned it off, and then the house phone rang. And I ran to, to didn't want to wake anybody up, and it was my mum. And she just said, well done, son. Well done. And that, that, 
That was the one that made me just go, I did it. You know, she, you know, she just said, well done. I'm proud of you. And then I suddenly started having the confidence to look at some of these other messages, mm. and they were all positive. Some from really people I haven't seen for years. People, some people, one, one from you know, somebody very high up in the BBC just saying, saying that he'd, he'd already shown it to somebody in his family because it happened to his father. Just somebody, just telling me this out of nowhere. He said it happened to their father and they'd, they'd never spoken about it. And he said he saw the documentary and he phoned his brother up and said, you've got to come in and watch this. And he said, we hadn't spoken about it in like 30 years. But because you've done that, we thought we've got to talk about what happened to our dad. So I thought I'd done something that was useful. Mm. And then I went to bed and I got up in the morning, I went for a walk and literally people were crossing the street and going, thank you so much, thank you. It was just so overwhelming. I was like, I, I, and I, was, I, I didn't expect any of that. And I had to just go home. And I, and I remember rushing into my therapist and just bawling my eyes out. Because I, I just couldn't take it. It was too much. Mm. But after a while, I started to kind of process it. And now people come up to me and say, thank you. And I'm, I, I can engage them in the conversation. I can talk to them about psychosis. It is so common. And in the newspapers today, there has been a 75% increase in the amount of psychosis in this country since the pandemic happened. It is so common, but it's, it's the least talked about mental health condition because it's the scariest one. It's where you get taken away. It's where you lose your mind. I'm just lucky that I came through it, that I've been able to talk about it. And the amount of people, young people, that it's happened to is extraordinary. So there's you suppressing it, but you, what you're saying is that there's a, there's a societal suppression yeah. of this yeah. um, condition. Yeah. Um, and you've kind of, it seems like you've unlocked it for, or given license, maybe. Given license to talk about it, because yeah. as I say, it is one of the most common uh, mental health conditions, but it's some, somehow it's shrouded in shame. And I've never understood that, because it was one of the most extraordinary experiences I've ever had. But I guess if you're, uh, I mean, I'm imagining People feel shame because they're out of control. They're doing things that they wouldn't do normally. Yeah. They're, I mean, there are some... I mean, they are quite funny stories of you pissing out of a window in, in one of them. I mean, I thought it was funny. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I only remember... That's been in my mind for years. And I kept thinking, was I drunk when that happened? I kept thinking, I must, I must have been drunk. That must have been when I was drunk one time. And then when I was looking through my medical records, it says that I was incontinent in the middle of a meeting. I was like, the patient got up and urinated out of the window. And I went, fuck, that's where that memory came from. And it was only because my, the therapist, the, 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 the um, psychologist in my documentary, Erin Turner, who's wonderful, she's become a really good friend of mine. She read my medical records and it was her that told me that I was over-medicated. It was her that told me that those drugs are no longer in use because they had massive side effects. Weight gain, um, uh, stiffness. I can remember I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't walk, I couldn't move. And I've always wondered what the hell that was about. It was these drugs, they were just filling me with this crap. And it also had a, 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 an effect on my urinary system because I would literally just piss. And I don't know whether it's because I'm an actor, but I, I have no shame in talking about this. You know, I really don't. And I I'm, I'm feel very blessed about that. Mm. But the fact that I can talk about it seems to have made this, people now, people now say, oh, thank you, I had psychosis, and now I'm talking about it. There was a girl at Cheltenham last week who had a psychotic breakdown and she said, when people saw your documentary, they don't, they don't look at me as, as weird anymore. Because they know it happens, to any, it happens to people. So that's what I'm trying to, that's why I'm kind of talking about this, is because I'm trying to reduce that stigma. Because the more we can reduce that stigma, the more people will talk about it, the more we can have an open, converse, open discussion about it, and people will feel, will feel less shame 
when um, experiencing mental health conditions. And where are we in terms of particularly uh, black men? You said they're still over-medicated. Mm. They're still over-represented. Mm. Has anything changed for the better? And if so, what? I'd like to say yes, but I don't think there is. Um, I'm doing a, an event on Wednesday with um, mental health practitioners who were telling us that this thing happens today. That there are still men, black men, uh, uh, sitting in mental health in mental health facilities, over medicated, p people dying, being medicated. So it's it's a bit of a it's a major problem in this country that we just that no one seems to be talking about. And whether it's whether it's growing up in this, as you say, this system, this space, and being. And I saw these two guys today. I was walking down the street today. You know, they've got the matted beard and the, you know, they're just sitting on the street. And I'm just thinking, you know, obviously they've just lost it. Yeah. Given up. Just given up. And I don't know. This, it's this, I think there's something particularly to, particular to England and America. And, and many of the people in America who are shot by police or, you know, mm. You know, people will see a strange man walking down the street, they'll call the police, and he'll get shot, get tasered, end up in a mental institution or end up in prison. Well, I think certainly in Chicago, where I used to live, the prisons were the biggest purveyors of mental, any mental health. Um, I mean, basically, you would, have a, you would have a mental health problem. Because yeah. of that, you would end up in prison. In prison. And in prison, you might get Medicaid because there's no, because there's no um, social, you know, there's exactly. no NHS. Exactly, no, so, no social debt. Um, but I'm, I'm just thinking, because you, you talk about these, um, these people that you saw and have given up, but there is something societal there, isn't there? That mm. kind of, they may have given up, but also society has given up on them that there is a kind of, um, I always worry as I get older that it could be that I'm just misremembering what things were like. I do know that there was a time when I don't remember there being food banks. Now I see a lot of them. Um, and similarly, I feel like I see more people struggling openly in the way that you're talking about, on the street, uncared for, uh, uh, unkempt. I see more of that now than I did. And that obviously is partly about them and their condition, but it's also partly it's about us. It's about society. And, I, and I, I've been back. I've, I've spent 10 years in America and Canada. Mm. It's different. I've come back to a different country. And... I found myself getting a little down. I found myself, I find it tough. It's tough here. And, um, you know, you've got to be careful. I've got to be, I, I, the, I use, you know, I stop using social media. I stop engaging because I can't take it. It's just overwhelmingly depressing. Mm. And sometimes I just have to just say I can't engage. And that's bad. I think that can be unhealthy, but I have to do that to preserve my mental health. Because if I don't, I'm going to get, I'm going to get depressed. Mm. Well, there's something about, and you mentioned the rise in psychosis since uh, the pandemic, and there's something about this last year and a half where we've all been at home and we've all had social media, and yet, I don't know about the other people in the audience, but kind of didn't take long for me to crave something like this, that I didn't actually fully appreciate the... What we missed. Yeah, the, the power and the joy of actually seeing people. It was, so, it was so common, but also like you, I did not grow up. It's one of what I do, I think I find the young inspiring in a range of ways, and I worry about them in this way, that I didn't grow up with social media. We grew up with the telly, but um, I wasn't then texting yeah. my friends, but I mean, I see 
Um, I won't say my son because then he won't be able to say that I talked about him. But I see young people um, uh, hanging out and they'll be hanging out, they'll be in the same room and they'll each be yeah. on their phone and, and I kind of think, that can't be good for you. And then I realised that I thought that when I looked up from my computer on a Saturday and I'm thinking, well, first of all, what are you modelling here? But secondly, we're all at it. Mm. Um, and um, um, and I, I do feel like this last year has... given me a lesson in what I might be missing. Mm. Certainly, I mean, I was having the same conversation with my daughters the other day. You know, I, I think we're all going to see what, what is going to happen in the next 10, 15 years. Because the, the, the kids that w were born in this, gener in this mobile communicative generation will be... 30, 40, you know, they're going to be... It's going to be interesting to see what, that, mm. what, what the toll of mm. that is or what their aspirations are. Or, you know, make, we, we, hope, we hope it's not too catastrophic. Well, I mean, and, and I wouldn't want to overdo it because they were the ones that came out for the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Mm. They were the ones... They're more connected. They're, yeah. And they're, they're much more connected. And they're actually, they're much more... In, in certain ways, they're more... They're, more they're, savvy. More savvy. They're, you know, they're, they're more gender fluid. You know, they're okay with, you know, gender fluidity. They're okay... They're not, they're not okay with racism. So, so there's... Maybe there is some sort of collective identity that they... That they that they that they have, or that they will will have, or collective understanding that they will have, that mm. might be actually be beneficial. We don't actually know, I guess. Um, I'm gonna start taking some questions from first of all from our audience beyond, uh, from those who are watching us uh, on um, uh, on the streaming and. Um, uh, the first one says, what was the greatest difference for you between making the documentary and writing the book? That's a very good question. How did the writing shape the way you encountered your memories? Well, the documentary was a shock to me, as I say. I, I had no idea. When I, when I, there's a scene where I go back to the hospital with my two friends who were with, were with me on the day I got sectioned. And I literally had forgotten all about that. I buried it. Mm. And uh, it was very scary to suddenly be confronted with that pain. And again, you know, I, I was, you know, Nick was saying I was on my knees saying, I have to save the boy. Screaming at the top of my voice in the hospital, I have to save the boy. I mean, it's extraordinary. And then I realised that that boy is me. I had to save my young, I, I, I had to get back to my younger self. And I think in the book, that's what took me back to this young boy sitting at the knee my, with my dad and mum watching TV. And that's the boy I had to get back to because I'd lost contact with that. Yeah. And so for me, the book, the book enabled me to look back, search how that boy came apart. There's a chapter called The Collapse of the Young Black Boy in my book. And now I understand how that young black boy fell apart. I mean, you fell apart like a rocket, though, because you were you were flying high. You were doing really well. I mean, you were a, you were a RADA. You had had um, uh, graduated from RADA. I mean, you were kind of. Um, I was a bit. I was you know fresh out of drama. It was a kind of hot young thing, mm. but but. I was, you know, I was being asked questions. You know, you're playing Romeo, but Romeo's not really black. What do you think about playing a black Romeo? And I was, I, I just didn't understand that stuff. I came out into a very politicised. I suddenly realised I was politicised. Mm. My talent was politicised, and I just didn't understand it. So I just, so, so I just, you know, I, I spent the majority of my life dreaming of acting and fun and. Make believe and costumes and makeup. And suddenly it was all about my colour. But you're black. You can't do that. You can't. Do... And it just, it was, uh, it was just, and very, very personal reviews and very, very personal articles about me. 
nasty stuff being written about me because I was doing Shakespeare. It was, it was tough. I mean, here's one of the things that's intriguing about the way that you describe that, is that there, there will be people, maybe not, what, maybe not watching now, but um, who will listen to you now and say, why do you keep going on about it? That, I, I get that kind of often. Why do you keep going on about it? And I kind of... What's and, it? What do you, what but, you, race. Why do you keep going on about being black? Why do you keep... And my... Um, and my feeling is always like, because it's always there. And because I don't really have a choice. And you don't have to keep going on about being white. Because everything's white. You know, like, nobody ever asked me, when did you come out as a straight guy? because you don't have to come out as a straight guy, you can just be straight. And, um, um, and the, what's interesting is that you went from kind of not really talking about it at all. Not being really, aware of it. And that that was actually um, a fault. part of your un undoing. Yeah, because, and that's why I say you have to understand yourself. Mm. You have to have that self-knowledge of who you are in order to progress. Mm. Because if you don't, as I say in the book, everything's okay until it isn't. Right up until the moment it, is, it isn't. And um, it's only when it isn't that you suddenly realise, oh shit, I'm the only black person here. Or, or um, you know, I've got this. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd, it's an odd experience. Mm. Um, was there any kind of catharsis in writing the book when reading your medical records was such a shocking and distressing experience? Was there any sense of rewriting your narrative? Uh, the, the medical records for me, as I said, I didn't open them for two years. I didn't look at them for two years. I was too scared to look at them. But um, having read them now, literally cover to cover, I sort of see and remember everything. So it's been, a, it's been about recovering lost memories, mm. um, re, like I said, I'd buried all that. I'd buried all of that experience. And now I'm sort of in possession of it and I own it. Um, whereas before, I think, because it's, I, I feel like I found a missing jigsaw puzzle piece. And now that I've kind of slotted it in, I just feel more whole. I mean, and I, I, now I, I say to myself, you know, for 30 years I've been walking around kind of not quite myself. I was play acting, David Harewood. But now I kind of really feel as though I, I, I'm in full position of my own, full uh, possession of my own story. And that's, sometimes I get sad about that because I think I don't really know who I was for 30 years. But at least I'm glad I'm glad, I, I'm glad I know it now. There's an there's a interesting, I don't know if you've um, read the book or aware of it, My Name is Len Sisse. Right, um, I've heard about that. Um, he is a, a, a poet, mm. and he has, he's written this book, which is, he finds, he is put into the foster system, and there's a, a whole, and then just spat out. And there's a whole awful scenario of someone playing God, almost literally. His mum trying to get hold of him, his mum trying to get him back, and this um, social worker thinking he knows best. Anyway, he, f he gets his records, and the book is about him getting his records, and he actually did a play about it. Mm -hmm. And the, the more I think about it, the more I think, he's about our age, which is... <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> and um, um, there is something about, and this would probably still be true, um, about who we think we are and who we know we are and how officialdom in whatever guise understands us, describes us, frames us and what those consequences are. Mm. That we are walking around thinking we are being ourselves, which we are in a sense, uh, and yet we are being understood categorised in these official ways, um, which I cannot imagine how many 
prison records, police records, must be out there of different people which kind of um, would distort in that way or, or describe in that way. Mm. They could be describing things that actually happened or they could be framing things in but ways that didn't. It's also, I mean, like, I, mean, I think it's on, uh, the, the, the programme on tomorrow night, uh, Thousand Years a Slave, on Channel 5, where I go back to Barbados and find my... I'm given my... Um, I uncover my links to my, my, to my, to my great-great-great-grandfather who was born a slave on the uh, Thicket's plantation. And that's literally the moment the name Harewood was uh, uh, when we were emancipated. <laughs> it's the, the, that moment that Richard, R Richard was the first, I found my, my basically found my great, great, great grandfather, great grandparents, uh, mm. Richard and Betty. And that's where the name Harewood. And then you do this family, they did, gave me the family tree and you go, Richard, you know, had a son, Nathaniel, Nathaniel had a son. Bartholomew, you know, and then you go Romeo and then David, and you think, wow, it's a really powerful moment when you see a slave to David Harewood, and you just understand your story, and you think, wow. Well, and the notion that you even have a story, I think, yeah. growing up, black, it was like that my story started in Hitchin, somehow, and that the notion that there was a before that the, I, I knew I had a granny, but I didn't know my granny because she lived in Barbados. And the kind of, there is this notion that we don't have a history. Yeah. Um, uh, which, given this is a, a, a literature event, I would also recommend uh, uh, Fruit of the Lemon by Andrew Levy, which pursues that. She kind of, she, she follows, a, a fictional character follows her kind of family tree and kind of finds her story, because then she's able to locate herself yeah. in the world as being part of something bigger than your Well, that's exactly what self. I'm saying. Now I understand, I'm kind of, the first time I went to Harewood House, I thought it was just a coincidence, which I now think is ridiculous. <laughs> but now I understand it. Now I understand myself and the, the bigger picture of myself. So it's like filling all these different, it's color, it's like you know, a painting that you're kind mm. of, is deep, getting deeper and, and, and deeper. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, more, a deeper understanding of myself as I get older. Um, I'm sure he won't mind me saying this. My best friend, Ben, um, who, um, as it happens, went to Eton. And um, in his house somewhere, he, his parents live in this oast house, there, there is this kind of you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so, you know, the family tree all the way through. Um, and um, uh, I think, obviously, they're white. Um, and Ben gets a phone call at a certain point. He's living in Hackney, and it's an African-American lady saying, we're having a rakes reunion, you know, and um, uh, we saw that, you know, you, and we're just wondering how, whether you're related. It was, it's quite an unusual name, R-A-I-K-E-S. Anyway, he starts following it back, and of course there's some slave owners in Jamaica and, and so on. And what, one of the things that I find interesting about these conversations is the amount of heavy lifting we have to do mm. and the fact that actually these stories are very intimately entwined. And that, so slavery isn't just our story. It's Not at all, us. no. It's all of it. Well, how did he feel about that? Sorry? How did he feel about having slavery? Oh, he was slavery kind of being... like, um, I mean, he was up for it. Do you know what I mean? He was kind of, um, you know, he thought that figures. That figures, and it figures that I wouldn't know. And, um, I mean, he lived in Hackney, and the reunion was in Brooklyn, and he wasn't going to get to go. But there were these people who he, you know, who he was in contact now with now and it, you know, set the hairs racing. Um, but that, um, sometimes I wish more white people would do more lifting in terms of finding their connection well, to we, us. We, we literally, I did an event in Cheltenham with um, Alex Renton, who's mm. just written a book called um, uh, Blood Legacy, where he, in, he traces his, uh, he basically found a whole load of records in the attic and, and has, you know, asked, started asking questions and 
Granny said, yeah, oh, yeah, we, know, we dabbled in the slave trade when your great, your great grandfather dabbled in the slave trade. And, and so he's now trying to find all this out. And some of his family no longer talk to him. <laughs> they no longer talk to him because he's, you know, it's sort of, you're doing, you're doing, doing Britain down. Mm. You're, you, you know, it, and that's the essential, as you say, about the heavy lifting. It's, there's a lot more heavy lifting needs to be done. It's a peculiar thing, isn't it? When people do the kind of put the great back into Great Britain and you think, well, how did the great get into Great Britain? You know, and um, who paid for that? And the notion, which I always find intriguing, that people will say, we won the war, even if they weren't born, even if they didn't fight. They'll say, we won the World Cup, even if they didn't play, even if they weren't born. Who enslaved people? Well, that wasn't us. <laughs> I wasn't born. I wasn't there. It wasn't me. Yeah. yeah. And so that notion of a collective identity is so kind of very, so very uh, uh, selective. And I right. say this not as a kind of kumbaya, but just as a kind of like, um, uh, if one wants to know your history, really your history, not your mythology. Exactly. Then then it, sh it wouldn't be a surprise that we're here. And it wouldn't, you know, many of these things would become, your world would make more sense to you yeah. if you were to kind of understand it fully. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask one more from, um, uh, uh, from online, which is, Gary, you mentioned you didn't read for pleasure as a young person. What were the books that first got you hooked? The book that first got me hooked on Fiction was the color purple. It's just it, it was an easy read, these letters, and it was kind of captivating, and it clearly it didn't speak to me personally. I was you know I've never been to the south southern states of America or, but it kind of. Um, it electrified me. I thought mm. there's, there's, there's something in this reading thing. You mm. know, I could, I, could, I could get used to that. <laughs> um, uh, how about you? Was there a book that got you hooked? Um, yeah, uh, The Master of Margarita. Oh, wow. I, I remember as a kid, I think I was 15, but I was laughing out loud on the bus on the way to school. Just reading this obscure Russian... I don't know how I got... I was going to say. How the hell I got hold of it. But it was just one of the funniest books I've ever read. And it's so imaginative and so... It's this trippy, cat, yeah. This cat who gets loose in Russia. But it's just extraordinarily funny. And um, that's the one that really kind of set me alight and thought, I thought, I love the idea of books now. I'm going right. to get some more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to open it up to the audience. Um, uh, if there are any questions, if you raise your hands, we have uh, uh, people with microphones. you um i've got huge respect for you thank you so much huge respect for both of you um david who, who do you have most respect <laughs> <laughs> if you had to choose me more than him Mo <laughs> moving on um to me it makes complete sense that you wanted to reconnect with the young boy who felt safe um and it's yeah just extraordinary that that is couched in mad, you know, a sort of term called madness, when actually it makes complete, complete sense. sense. Yeah. Um, and as a doctor, I've never believed that medication is the complete answer. Um, and rather than suppressing things, I think it's about understanding the situation. Of course, medication, as you've said, just suppresses ev everything, so people can't think straight. Um, and I wondered whether your documentary is being used as part of training um, for mental health workers and all, all health workers, really. It is, which I'm really proud of. It's, um, it's now watched by uh, young uh, people are studying psychiatry. Um, I was actually, I've actually been awarded the President's Medal by the Royal College of Psychiatry um, this year. So, uh, because, 
because it's it's call, calls about psychosis rose 107 percent the night the, 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 the day after my documentary because people suddenly go oh that's what happened to mom that's what happened to dad that's what's happening to my sister no one there's been no language about it it's just dad's gone a bit funny or that's what it's been over the years so suddenly someone talking about psychosis and having somebody who's actually been through it be talk reasonably articulately about it is that is, is has enabled people to understand the subconscious uh, how that plays a part in your in your um in your delusions and hallucinations um and realize the importance of it so i'm, I'm that's, if anything i'm most proud of that 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 the doctors, doctors and young doctors are watching your documentary. Hopefully this will change. Yes, very much. So. Me too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the gentleman, yes. Thanks very much, David and Gary. I think it's really brave of you to come out here and talk about your experiences. Is there anything you think you could have done at an earlier age? Would you have wanted to talk about things earlier rather than bury them? Would that have helped? Um, I don't think so. I, I, you know, I, th I, I think people use that word brave. I, I, I just don't recognise it. The, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't understand that, understand that word. It's something that happened to me. And I'm, for, me, for, I, I, for me, it was one of the most extraordinary experiences I've ever had. Um, so, so I'm sort of... Um, you know, again, I have no shame of, of, of talking about it, but I think everything happens at the right time for the, and for the right reasons. And I just happened to tweet out. I, I tweeted it out, but I, I said, as somebody's had a breakdown, and, and, and you know, it was World Mental Health Day, and I just tweeted out randomly, as somebody's had a breakdown, I just want to say, look after yourself today and get some help if you can. Go easy on yourself. Got, put my phone away, got on a plane, flew to Vancouver, got off, and it was like 40,000 retweets. And I had a bit of a panic, uh, because then the BBC were ringing me up, ITV were ringing me up, and suddenly the whole thing exploded. And that's where this whole thing started. This, the documentary, that's where the documentary started. Because I then, I, then I, I wrote a, an article in the papers, and some, my friend who was with me on the day I got sectioned said, that's not how I remember it. And I went, oh, have I got this wrong? So that led me to then ask questions and find out. So it's been a bit of a journey for me of self-discovery. and Nothing was planned. Uh, it just happened at the right time. Um, I'm just glad that I got to tell it, and I'm glad I've got to experience it, because as I say, I feel so much better for doing it. I'm going to say, I think there is, the, the, in no small part, the bravery resides in you not recognising it as brave, actually. <laughs> that the, the, a sense of like, well, this happened, and I want to share. This, this moment in which I was very vulnerable, and in which I was... Um, uh, quite scared at times mm. um, is something that I want to talk about. The 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 general thing on social media is to show everybody how nice your life is, and how lovely your kids are, and how pretty your garden is. And you, you don't see you see pictures of people's nice meals. Yeah, you don't see pictures like look what the fuck happened here. Well, you know, but, but again, just to, you know, I get all these really crazy experiences. But one, I was walking, I walked my dog across the heat, and this this black guy saw me across, and, and he ran to me, Gary, and he went, I don't know how you did that, man. I don't know how you did that, but thank you. And he was he took cries. He was, he, I don't know how you did it. I could never do that, but I just want to say thank you, thank you, brother. Cry. And I'm like, wow. You know, it seems as, as though it's helped a lot of people. Mm. And that's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get, I, I, I mean, I do get it. I get the fact that, uh, well, this is what happened and I'm going to, but that, um, that man's response is because nobody before had come forward and, and, and done that. And, um, that's what I thought. I thought I was broken some, yeah. some code or some. Well, you, know, you had some masculine. <laughs> some masculine. Um, and um, y you can say you're not brave. That's your. But like, um, um, I'm not buying it. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Um, hi there, um, David. As you were saying before, and it's part of your journey 
of um, not seeing representation. That's part of kind of what helped, what um, led to some of the unraveling and, and things that happened. That's the reason why your story has resonated so much because there are so many people, especially young black men, who are going through psychosis and things like that. And the reason that, as you said, they don't want to talk about these things or they feel that there's a, a, a taboo or a stigma about it, that seeing someone like yourself who is um, successful, seemingly the world at their feet, and still had that happen to them, and then being able to talk about it and um, do so in a way that's so candid and, as I said, without shame, is ultimately why what you have done has resonated so much. Um, you know, I um, have family members who have had um, psychotic breaks and things like that. Um, you know, other people that are close to me have had that as well. So I think what I would like to say is thank you. Thank you for doing what you did. Um, as you said, you have had small snippets of people coming up to you and, and giving you a, a, an indication of how much that meant. But especially in the black community, we don't tend to talk about these things. It's swept under the rug. It's, it's, it's um, made into, you know, sometimes it may be demonized. But it's about being human. And you have shown that not only are you a human, and with, with feelings and everything like that, but actually being vulnerable is sometimes the strongest thing that you can do. And thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, and what a way to end. We, I'm, I'm afraid we, we have to end. We could go on and on. There was some of you may be thinking, First night for a year and a half. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll go and listen to, you know, a story about breakdown, race, <laughs> racism, <laughs> Britain, psychosis. That seems like a night out. <laughs> and yet, here we are. We've been inspired. We're grateful. I do think that you have, you've offered a, you've, you have offered one of those options to people, one of those stories that people can tell themselves about who they might be, about who they uh, could be. Uh, you've done it eloquently. You've done it both in film uh, and uh, for those who do read books, uh, you've, you've done it in books and you, um, and you, you talk about it in an accessible human way. You're not, you're not trying to be... You didn't come in a cape. I have got one. Though. You had, well, I should hope so, Supergirl. Um, uh, and, um, and, and for that, I mean, we've been engaged. Um, and uh, I think I speak for the audience when I say that uh, uh, we're grateful. And, uh, and uh, I echo the, uh, the words of the young men there. Thank you. So thank you, David. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.